Hey what's up guys, welcome to another revision video on IGCSE Biology. Today we're going through human reproduction and this is a humongous topic so without further ado, quickly take a look at the syllabus and we'll begin the video. The first thing we're going to be looking at is the male reproductive system. So let's just take it step by step. First of all we have the testes which produce sperm, and sperm as you know it is the uh, the male gamete in sexual reproduction. Once the sperm is made, it gets stored in something called the epididymis. And the scrotal sac has an important role of holding the testes outside of the body to keep it cool, simply because sperm production doesn't work quite well under normal uh, body temperatures. So it needs to be a bit cooler, which is uh, which the scrotal sac allows. Sperm then enters the sperm duct, which carries the sperm to the prostate gland. The important thing here is the prostate gland actually adds nutrients and fluid to the sperm and we then start to call it uh, semen, which is a mixture of sperm, nutrients and fluid. It then connects, it, uh, connects the uh, semen to the urethra. So the urethra is connected by the uh, sperm duct and it's also connected by the bladder which holds urine. Basically, therefore, urethra passes either semen or urine out through the penis, but this never happens at the same time. So the urethra connects to the penis, which is a sort of a structure that can become firm and insert itself into the vagina. So, taking a look at the femur reproductive system, it looks a little bit easier. We've got the entry point of the penis, which is the vagina, and the vagina and, 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 uh, is, is separated from the uterus, which we'll look at in a second, by something called the cervix, which is basically at a simple level, a ring of muscle that separates the vagina from the uterus. The uterus is basically where fetal development happens, and we're going to be going through that in a bit more detail in a second. The ovaries here, which you have, or which uh, there's two ovaries per uh, female reproductive system, these basically produce egg cells, the female gamete of sexual reproduction, and the egg cells actually uh, get secreted into the oviduct, which is a tube that connects the ovary to the uterus. The oviduct uh, is basically the site of fertilization, which is quite important. And uh, another important function of the oviduct is it physically uh, propulses the egg uh, from the site of entry point, from this end here, all the way into the uterus. Uh, so the egg cell is carried physically by the walls of the oviduct, which have this little cilia, which basically push it along. So, we took a look at uh, fertilization and quite briefly, and we said that fertilization, which is the meeting point between the egg and the uh, sperm, actually happens in the oviduct, right? So let's take a look at that in a bit more detail. The sperm is highly mobile. This is the structure of a sperm, and you're required to know it. We've got the tail, or the flagellum, which allows its mobility. Um, and the mitochondria within the flagellum allow the, uh, the sperm to respire and therefore produce the energy for the flagellum to become mobile. We've got the acrosome, which is sort of the head of the, uh, of the sperm, and it contra contains enzymes, which are really important because the enzymes will act to digest the walls of the egg cell, allowing high penetrative power of the egg uh, through the egg. So taking a look at the egg cell, Oppositely, you have the nucleus, as all cells do. It has something called a zone pellucida, which you guys just need to refer it as a jelly coat. The jelly coat has two main functions. One, to protect the egg cell, and two, to initiate the, uh, the reaction of the sperm, and specifically the acrosome, to release enzymes once they connect. Right, so the, the jelly coat basically um, says, look, uh, we, we have met, so I will allow you to you know, secrete your enzymes and the enzymes will allow the sperm to therefore penetrate through the wall of the egg cell and cause fertilization. So taking a look at that in a bit more depth, from the ovaries the egg cell gets released into the oviduct. And in the oviduct, the sperm, if present, will actually fertilize the egg. And a fertilized egg is called a zygote which is just basically a combination of egg and, uh, and egg, egg, egg and sperm, 
right? And from that point on, the zygote actually multipl multiplies itself uh, drastically, and you can see stage by stage, it's you know got one cell here, two, three, four, you know, eight, and it does that many many times for it to become essentially what we call a ball of cells. The ball of cells is called an embryo, and the embryo eventually implants itself into the uterus lining or the wall of the uterus, and this initiates pregnancy. So just to give you a brief overview, and uh, with a bit more simplistic style of a diagram, you've got the ovary here, which releases the egg cell, which connects with the sperm and egg to form what we call a zygote. From this point on, the zygote multiplies itself uh, rapidly to form an embryo, which is a ball of cells that implants itself into the uterus lining. And this uh, this initiates a series of uh, of um, developmental processes that uh, eventually turn this you know single ball of cells into a developing fetus. So let's fast forward and pretend uh, that the you know fetus has already de developed to this point. Cambridge wants you to understand the generic uh, sort of um, diagram that is involved in this. You've got the vagina down at the bottom and you have the cervix which we already talked about. And uh, these new structures here, so basically the fetus is held within the amniotic fluid, right? It's a liquid, and the, the liquid is held within the amniotic sac. Now be very careful, the amniotic fluid doesn't provide nutrients to the baby at all. It's there for mainly protection. And so all of this is held within the uterus. How the baby actually gets nutrients is through the umbilical cord and the placenta. So let's take a look at that in a bit more detail. So, the umbilical cord is basically this tube-like structure here, which actually contains veins and arteries. The umbilical cord connects the baby uh, to the placenta. The placenta is basically a, 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 a sort of um, a sponge-like structure uh, that actually takes the fetal blood very, very close to the mother's blood, but never allowing it to mix. And there's a really important reason why the fetal blood and the mother's blood never mixes, and that's because any sort of mixing between the blood, especially if they have different blood types, can lead to clots, and clots can be crucially bad, or it can be quite fatal for both the fetus and the mother, so that's why you never mix the two blood. Right? Instead, the placenta allows the uh, veins and the arteries of the fetus to get really close to the mother's blood, allowing waste to go out and nutrients to come in, so that the baby uh, can receive good nutrients and oxygen, but also sort of uh, send off all the waste to the mother's blood. So this is where the sort of uh, the exchange happens. Placenta is where the exchange happens. So taking a look at that in a bit more depth, of course the baby will uh, respire and produce waste products and the waste products are ca is carried away from the fetus via what we call the umbilical artery. Think back into the cardiovascular lecture, the artery always carries blood away from the heart. So in this case, away from the fetus. And of course when it's carrying blood away from the fetus, it has deoxygenated blood. And once it gets to the placenta, it becomes very very close to the mother's blood and what happens then is the oxygen and the nutrients from the mother's blood actually enters uh, the blood vessels whereas the waste products and the carbon dioxide and things like that actually get diffused out to the mother's blood. What that means is the nutrients in the mother's blood uh, get gets delivered to the fetus and the waste products gets delivered out and the mother basically takes care of that through through her own system. So once this exchange happens, uh, what we get is the blood vessels actually carry the blood to the fetus now, and this is oxygenated, uh, really nutritious blood, and it's carried through the umbilical vein. And of course the vein always carries the blood to the heart, which in this case uh, makes a lot of sense. So it's actually very important for the mother to control herself uh, during the development of the, pe uh, of, of the fetus, right? So the mother's diet has to be quite balanced. You have to have the proteins for the growth of the fetus. You have to have calcium, which is mainly for bone development. And you also need iron, which is crucial for red blood cell development of the, uh, of the fetus. Uh, not only that though, you also have to be quite 
careful if you're a mother because poisonous things can also be transferred to the baby as well. That includes aspirin, heroin, you know, nicotine and carbon monoxide, alcohol, even viruses, all that sort of stuff. So it's, uh, it takes extreme care to make sure that the development of the fetus is happening smoothly. So let's take a look at birth. Once the fetus has developed to um, a certain point, what happens then is the labor is triggered by an oxytocin hormone. What that happens, uh, when that happens, sorry, the muscular walls of the uterus contract and that contraction breaks the amniotic sac and the amniotic fluid is released as a result. The contracts become the contractions become a lot more frequent, sorry that was a typo, and uh, it essentially pushes the baby physically down the cervix. The cervix becomes dilated along with the vagina so that the baby can actually pass through the body and um, be let out into the world. Once the baby is out, it's still attached to the placenta via the umbilical cord. What happens then is the doctors cut off the umbilical cord and tie it and that becomes our belly button. The placenta naturally break, breaks away from the uterus wall and also passes out through the vagina. So let's just imagine that the baby is born. Now we need to think about you know breast milk um, and this is a pretty controversial sort of argument but Cambridge just wants you to understand the pros and cons of breast milk compared to formula. So um, a lot of this is sort of self-explanatory. Um, you've got natural antibodies in breast milk, and of course, being natural, it's also risk-free of allergic reactions. Okay, the breast milk is also kept at very ideal temperatures, and of course, since you don't find any sort of additives or preservatives, uh, that's also a really good thing. People also argue that a good bond is sort of uh, established between the mother and the baby if you breast milk. There are cons, of course, because in public, people not people not, not, not might uh, might not perceive that to be um, to be okay. You've got uh, pain associated. It can, it can actually be quite painful for the mother during breastfeeding, and of course, the mother has to be present herself. So, thank you for watching, guys. It's a pretty long topic, but I hope this video has uh, enabled you to understand some of the concepts in a bit more um, in a bit more depth. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video.